on the line, I'm going to get going. I'll uh, share my screen. And uh, that's always successful when um, we can see our screens when we're online. I'm going to just slideshow from the beginning. Uh, maybe I'm not. How do I get that back? Okay, slideshow here. Um, where is my from? Play from start over at the. Play from start. Of course, it's the first thing. Sorry. Thank you very much. I get by with a little help from my friends. Thank goodness. Thank you, Eileen. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. I can see a lot of uh, familiar and friendly faces, and I'm so glad to see all of you. And thank you very much for coming to our third of the spring uh, speaker series. We have an incredible night uh, planned for you. I'm, I'm really so excited about what's on deck, and I know that you're gonna be too. So I won't take too much of the time with the intro. I'll do a few housekeeping things, and then I'll turn it over to our fabulous panel. Um, just want to let you know that tonight's evening is on sustainability and agriculture. And I think that you we're hearing a lot about that uh, these days. It seems to be coming from all directions. And so it's really nice to see that there's not only home economists, but really professions across the nation doing really incredible research-based, tradition tried and tested um, things. We're gonna hear about that tonight. And I think it really, I'm very excited to hear the um, richness that it's gonna bring to the dialogue. And I'll know I'll take it forward to people I know and students as well. We want to thank our amazing sponsors for having the spring series making it possible for us. Thank you very much to our gold sponsor, Canada Beef, and to our other sponsors, Canola Eat Well. They've really done some fantastic things to help us provide this evening and the other evenings to you. Egg Farmers of Ontario have been strong supporters and we love them too. Their products are fantastic. And we also have the Canadian um, Produce Marketing Association. And we're very happy to have them with us and certainly long foundations in sustainability and wonderful contributions to our uh, food system. So we wanna thank our sponsors very, very much. Also, um, now why is my screen not going forward? There we go, oh, it went back. Something's happening, I'm sorry on my end. Technically tonight, I can't advance my screen. Um, Sorry, I apologize. This is the first time it's happened. I'm, it's, it's my excitement. I'm getting too, too distracted. I can't do my job. Um, well, really, we wanted to give you a great big welcome. So welcome, 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 everybody. And tonight we have the incredible Michelle McAdoo from Canada Beef. And later on, we'll have uh, an inspiring Amy Peck, who is from the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, going to tell us lots of exciting things and share something special with us. We'll move on then to 745 with the invigorating Sandra Voss, uh, beef farmer from not too very far away from all of us. And then we'll carry on to eight o'clock tonight to the insightful Carly Raymer from Ducks Unlimited. And I know I'm uh, really looking forward to what she has to say. We're gonna, we're gonna gather uh, at 815 for our drawn prizes that Rebecca Hartley's coordinating for us. And then at 820, we'll have our final remarks and, and a good night and best wishes. So. Without further ado, that's what we have on deck. These are our incredible panelists that um, are going to be speaking this evening. Hopefully you saw them on our web and Michelle's gonna tell you a little bit more about each of them. So for now, it's just to let you know that they're coming and I will carry on with my introduction and welcome to Michelle McAdoo who has been, I think, somebody who we all know as the secret sauce of home <laughs> economics across Canada. Somebody keeps putting it all together and makes it fantastic. And, and for me, that's Michelle. She's always in the scenes somewhere doing something fantastic for us, including helping us arrange an evening like tonight. So there's really not enough time to ever thank Michelle for all that she's done. Not uh, the least to be uh, a gold sponsor with Canada Beef and really doing incredible things to get the word out and making sure families and the people that are important to us know all of the wonderful things that are available to us through, uh, through Canada Beef. So thank you very, very much, Michelle, for all that you do. Welcome and over to you. Okay, thanks, Peggy. That was a very nice introduction. And welcome everyone to this evening's discussion. I wanted to uh, thank you on behalf of Canada Beef uh, for some of you who may be not familiar with Canada Beef, we are the uh, not-for-profit organization responsible for promoting and marketing Canadian beef, both within Canada and globally. We have offices in Toronto and Calgary, as well as international offices in Mexico, Japan, China, and Taiwan. 
And then we also do uh, quite a bit of export marketing. Uh, so our bosses are the 60,000 beef producers and ranchers across Canada. So I have to be in my best behavior because one of my bosses is here this evening, Sandra Voss. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm really thrilled to introduce this panel of speakers. Um, I have had the distinct pleasure for several years to work with each of these uh, collaborating, working and creating some amazing content with these uh, individuals. And I thought when we were planning the series together, we, we did one where it was a breakout sessions, um, one where we uh, just stayed together and did a chat. And I thought for this round, what we would like to do with the Zoom technology is to introduce polls. So I think we'll bring up the first poll question, Eileen, on, um, yes, the first one. So the question is, and so you can uh, use your uh, poll ability to select whatever one you want, and you can see, Beef cattle production in Canada represents what percentage of the total greenhouse gas emissions? So um, we'll let the team, we'll let participants, we'll see how many looked at the social posts that Brooklyn put out. And it is closed. Wow, that's fantastic. And so, oh. Where, where did we end there? Was it 2.4 or what was it, Eileen? I think you're on mute, Eileen. I think it was 2.4 was the main group. Yes, that's okay. the answer. Thank you, okay. Yeah, that's so, so that's great. So while questions about water use and greenhouse gas emissions in the agriculture section sector dominate the headlines, it's important to note that there's a lot of mis or mixed information on social media and then also in the media. So why did I ask that particular question? A lot of people want to throw out the comment and we see it all the time, oh we know cattle are the issue or greenhouse problems are because of cattle. Well the answer to that question and you guys got it right, that was great, 2.4%. So where are some of the larger contributors to greenhouse gases in Canada? Transportation is at 28%, for example, and heat and electricity is at 46%. So the reality is that cattle contribute to a thriving environment. So I, leading into that then, I'd like to introduce to you our first panelist today is Amy Peck. Amy leads the public and stakeholder engagement team for the Canadian, Beef, uh, Canadian Cattlemen's Association. And Amy's role is to work to increase public trust in the Canadian beef industry by supporting industry synergies, forming strategic partnerships, and connecting positively with consumers and the public. And I know she does a really great job on that. We are continuously working together to bring a strong voice for people to learn, because that's the most important thing is sharing facts and facts are facts <laughs> and uh, getting that information out. She addresses industry issues by coordinating key messages and specific responses. And we work collaboratively together on these different types of projects. Um, one that you may have seen, if any of you are Toronto Star uh, uh, paper readers, um, we did a program along with the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef with Owen Roberts, and it was Cooking by Degrees. And it was a 16 part Session, um, articles, it was mainly on digital with chefs from different universities across Canada. And Owen Roberts combined a chef with one of our producers. Sandra was one of the participants as well. And it's a really interesting series if you want to go on to uh, Toronto Star, Cooking by Degrees, you can search for. And it's got some really good understanding of where universities come from. I have to say, when I went to University at Ryerson, we did not have a cafeteria like this. So, wow, they have really upped the game university. <laughs> and they talk about that. So I'd like to introduce uh, Amy, who's, uh, I, you're going to really enjoy listening to Amy this evening. She's a fantastic person. Amy, on to you. Wow. Well, oh, thanks, Pastor. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> An introduction like that. Um, I will say that Michelle is a, an absolute delight to work with, as you all probably know. 
Um, so thanks so much for having me here tonight. First of all, um, I do think Eileen, we were going to start it off with my polling question, if you're able to bring that up, um, which will really set the stage for um, what I would uh, love to be focusing on tonight. And that is, of course, the benefits of um, raising cattle and what they can do for the environment. So I'm not sure if we're able to bring that up. Um, Eileen. Amy, I'm sorry. Um, I seem to be stuck on the first poll. <laughs> okay. I don't know if anyone else oh, can help. Oh, somebody I else helped me. Set. Okay. We're all set. Yeah. I see it. So in front of you is um, our poll question. Um, so if you could just take a minute and vote um, on that, that would be wonderful. Seeing those numbers rolling in. Oh, this is mm. dead even. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> I love the real time uh, <laughs> updates that you get as well. It's great. Looks like we just have a couple last to put their votes in. They were going to think really hard about it. So <laughs> I love it. So it looks like we are we are just about 50 50 on the question. So of course, the question is, did you know that Canada's native temperate grasslands are an endangered ecosystem? So looks like about half of us knew this, which is great. Um, it was definitely new information for me in my role at, at the Canadian Cattlemen's, um, but about 44% or, you know, right around half did not know that. And I would say that, you know, I think the majority of Canadians do not have any idea that we have this endangered ecosystem. So I'm going to close the poll. I'm going to get ready to share my screen here. Um, so as Michelle mentioned, uh, public and stakeholder engagement, we look to raise public trust in the way beef cattle um, are raised in Canada. And originally we were really on the issue side. So we were responding to negative media articles. Um, and pretty quickly it was determined that we can't always be on the defensive. Um, you know, that's kind of the stereotypical beef producer who's, you know, angry about the, the media coverage. And we really, we have such a great story to tell on behalf of those farmers and ranchers across the country. So we've been starting to focus more on proactive uh, communications. And out of this came uh, a short documentary. It's called Guardians of the Grasslands. And when we uh, filmed it, we didn't set out to create a short documentary. It was actually just telling the story um, of this large grazing co-op that borders either side of the highway as you go down um, uh, Highway 22 in Southern Alberta. And what we, what we noticed is that there's no signs saying, you know, what you're seeing on either side. And, and so we just started to create a, a short film that would be on a, you know, you could scan a QR code on the sign and, and get the story of, it's called the Waldron Ranch Grazing Co-op. But out of talking to all of these associated experts, um, Ducks Unlimited Canada and the Nature Conservancy of Canada, we just found that there's, you know, such a neat story to tell about uh, the state of grasslands in Canada and, and how Canadians, you know, would be so interested to hear this, but also the, the curious hero that emerges in this story, which, which are cattle, and that they're um, maintaining native grasslands for, you know, all of us to enjoy. So with that, I will uh, mute myself. Um, we'll start Guardians of the Grasslands. It's just over 12 minutes, and then I'll, uh, we'll all join back in later, and I'll have a couple uh, final points to go through after that. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy Guardians of the Grasslands. Walk down the street and ask any Canadian to name the world's most endangered ecosystem. Chances are they'll say either the rainforests or the coral reefs. These two ecological hotspots are the focus of international campaigns to protect biodiversity. Well, the international community has been making its opinion clear. They're the subject of social awareness campaigns through the news and social media. As you walk down grocery aisles, you'll see products with logos about protecting marine life or rainforests. And chances are your favorite restaurant has started offering paper straws. There's no denying the impact we are having on the planet. And with all this increased awareness, you may be surprised to find out that one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world is actually one we have right here in Canada. Here in West
Western Canada, we have less than 20% of our native grasses left. In some areas, that number is as low as 13%, which is really sad because you think of the cultural significance that these grasslands have for Western Canada, first the indigenous peoples, and then the settlers that came out. Everybody talked about the prairies as being a vast inland sea of grass. And honestly, if you've ever had the opportunity to spend an afternoon in a grassland when the wind is blowing and you hear it swishing, you would think that you're in a sea. But it's disappearing, and it's disappearing at a real alarming rate. The loss of Canada's native grasslands is also a loss for the world. Humans depend on nature for our very survival. And the loss of grasslands creates major environmental issues such as flooding, loss of wildlife habitat, and a reduction in soil carbon sequestration. In healthy native grass, there can be over a hundred different plant species within a five acre radius. Not only are there plants, but there's a lot of different wildlife. There's more than 80% of Canada's species at risk that depend on grasslands. Um, by losing our grasslands, it's actually going to be extremely impactful on the majority of our endangered species. Basically with grass, what they say is that you've got uh, what you have above ground, you also have below ground. So if you have grass that looks like this above ground, then you also have roots that look like this below ground. But with native prairies, the, it's like threefold where the roots really extend deep into the soil. The benefit of that is there's two uh, cycles of carbon and, and the above ground stuff every year in the spring, like right now, it's sucking carbon from the air and producing uh, plant matter above ground and below. But all the stuff above ground gets cycled back into the air again within usually by the end of the summer or for sure by the next year. The, the stuff that goes into the ground is the roots and that stuff's what becomes really stable and long lasting in the soil. And that's how they build organic matter here. So this ranch is 65,000 acres and it sequesters, currently right now, there are approximately 2 million tons of carbon, which is the equivalent to the emissions from over 100,000 Canadians for a year. So that is stable long-term and permanent in the ground as long as we have uh, an intact uh, ecosystem and cattle grazing on it. Over the last decade, the story of cows and the environment has been a hot topic. But the narrative has been focused on cattle's contribution to climate change and the destruction of the rainforest. The idea that cattle could be integral to the health of an ecosystem is a very different story. In order to understand the real impact of cattle on a specific ecosystem, we have to look at the context. The context is so important. We're not standing in a rainforest, we're standing on the Canadian prairie. And, and so in that context, we need grazers and we need a livestock industry to keep the prairie, what's precious left of it, uh, where it is. And so in our Canadian context, let's think about what's most sustainable for, for here. So what role do cattle play in the grasslands ecosystem? What happens is the, the glaciers came and wiped off all the topsoil, so we had no life. There was nothing here, and it grew topsoil down into the soil. I always thought that topsoil grew up and it was an accumulation of something, but topsoil actually, topsoil actually grows down into the dirt, and it's just a conversion of inorganic dead rock and silt and sand into actually this dark black life, which is like an Amazon rainforest, but underground, where you have little tiny T-Rex predators and they're going around and killing other things and, and prey animals and, and uh, parasites and it's a whole complex web underground, an ecosystem that's alive. And by having cattle here, they're uh, creating that life. They're the keystone species uh, in this ecosystem. It was the bison before them and the bison completely built this into the, into the ecosystem that we have today and built all the topsoil and sequestered all the carbon. And when they disappeared, these grasslands became sick and they needed to have another keystone uh, large herbivore grazing on it. When a keystone species is removed from a habitat, all other species are affected and some may disappear from that ecosystem or even become extinct. Without the presence of a grazing species on the grasslands, there's a devastating impact on the natural production cycle of the grass. In the fall, that top growth dies 
and the root underneath the soil stays growing. But because the top growth has died, if it's not grazed and removed, what happens in the spring is it gets harder for the new growth to grow up through it. So the grass actually ends up starting to smother itself and all of the other species around it. So really, you need to have the grazers on there that are helping to remove and eat off some of that growth so that it can start regrowing again in the spring. Without ranchers to keep these wide open spaces intact, we wouldn't have these amazing iconic landscapes. The families that own these ranches, uh, it's been in their family for generations. They genuinely care about the land. And there's a really direct correlation between healthy land and healthy cows. Uh, ranchers know that if they take care of the land, it's gonna benefit you know, the whole cattle production industry. And so there's this really symbiotic relationship between cows and native grassland. There's no better example of this than the story of the Grasslands National Park. Parks Canada, in hopes of preserving the prairie land and saving it from being plowed and turned into cropland, had their own ideas in 1988 about what would be good for the grass, and that did not include grazing. This created friction between Parks Canada and the local ranchers who argued that grazing and disturbance were critical to healthy native prairie. For 20 years, much of the grass lay idle, grazed only occasionally by wandering wildlife. So what happened after removing cattle from native grasslands? The grasslands lost its biodiversity, and tame species of grasses such as crested wheatgrass began to take over. This also impacted wildflowers, pollinators, and the homes of birds that nest in the native grasses. Fortunately, Parks Canada listened. They researched and worked closely with Saskatchewan ranchers, conservationists, and scientists to bring cattle back to the national park in order to benefit native birds and other species. We need that grazing impact. So when we think about the grass that we see here, when we have a grazer come along and, and you know, bite those plants and create um, an interesting and dynamic canopy structure in that grass, that creates homes and types of homes for all kinds of birds and all kinds of other animals and, and lets light down to the soil surface to let different types of plants uh, grow and compete and all of those things add to the biodiversity and, and these bio-rich um, communities that we have. There's deer and elk and grizzly bears and worms and all sorts of things in here and if you were to cultivate this and grow lettuce you would have to get rid of all of those other things, whereas cattle just share the ecosystem. They don't um, use it completely, they just share it with everything else. And that's what's really special is that cattle are able to, to be a part of the ecosystem without damaging it, but actually to benefit it. While the native prairie ecosystem is a pretty tough ecosystem, it can survive a lot. The one thing it can't survive is being broken up. When the native prairie is plowed or tilled or converted for other uses, uh, even if it's only used in, under those different uses for five or ten years and then seeded right back down to grass, it never comes back in this part of the world as true native prairie. When the Canadian prairies were settled, a large portion of the native grasslands were lost to the development of cities and towns, construction of highways, and the plowing of land for growing crops and other uses. With 74% of Canada's native grasslands now lost forever, preserving what's left is critical. Working with ranchers to help manage the grasslands by using domesticated livestock to graze the land that bison roamed for thousands of years may be able to preserve this precious resource for future generations. Right now, we have a choice. But if we wait until it's gone, there won't be a choice left to make. I heard a quote once and it talked about the extinction of a species and it's a very very powerful quote because it, it said is a species extinct when there are no longer any species left on the planet or they are or are they extinct when there are so few they can't hear each other calling to each other. So could you imagine that, being an animal that calls this place home? 
and there's so few spaces left that you can survive that you can't hear any of your mates calling. So, you know, the thing is, is being in conservation, you kind of have to be an eternal optimist and I'm very optimistic. And I really think that this, these are beautiful landscapes. They provide so much to humans. And I think we've all come to a spot in our, in our civilization where we're starting to realize that we depend on nature and we really have to live in symbiosis with it. So uh, I really think that there's a lot of hope for these grasslands that if enough people start to care about them, we'll never have to wonder, we'll never have to wonder if they go extinct or not. Guardians of the Grasslands. I have to turn my video off every time because uh, it still gets me. I must say I watched the film, I would honestly say a thousand times or more. And still when I watch it, I think especially uh, knowing uh, Mackenzie is her name who is talking at the end. And it's just, it's so authentic to who she is as a person. And it's really, that's how she feels. Oh, it just, it gets me still. So I'll bring up my uh, presentation that I have now. Um, so really just want to extend on some of the, the themes that we explored um, in the film itself. Um, so just let me know if there's any problems there with seeing my presentation, Michelle, but hopefully, hopefully we're good to go. So this is a, <laughs> perfect. This is a um, slide that I actually did steal from the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Um, and it, it just shows the, the state of Canada's native temperate grasslands. So on the left hand side there um, is showing you, you know, circa 1850, you know, here's what, uh, where the grasslands extended to. So you can see really, you know, throughout most of the prairie provinces, we're seeing these large tracts of, of intact prairie. And then on the right hand side, um, that's a picture from 2016. So the red um, indicates human altered landscape. And, and that's really, you know, the greatest threat to native grasslands is development. And so, you know, that can be urban development and that can be converting um, that land to other uses, such as, such as growing crops, like they say in the film. So you can see that, uh, you know, the vast majority has, has been altered. Um, as they say in the film, you know, more than 76% has been um, converted to other purposes. But there are still, you know, these large intact swaths of, uh, you know, native grasslands. And, and really that is due to beef farmers and ranchers. Um, they're providing that economic viability for keeping these landscapes as grasslands, you know, and not um, converting them. And actually uh, Christine Tapley, who's in the film and, and works with Carly at uh, Ducks Unlimited Canada. Um, she was actually telling me today that the rate of loss is four football fields. Um, I believe it was a minute across Canada is just the rate that we're losing native grasslands. So it's just, it's interesting that we hear a lot, you know, as we explored in the films, you hear a lot about rainforests and you hear a lot about coral reefs and those ecosystems are very important and we need to work to protect them. But there's one that's, you know, right here at home in Canada as well that is just as threatened um, that needs our, our support as well. And so, 
you know, we know, um, speaking on behalf of sort of the beef community, that we have a really important role to play here, um, that a lot of this care of the native grasslands that's left is, you know, down to the individual uh, farmers and ranchers and their families um, that have cattle on these landscapes. And so, um, this year we've announced some, you know, what we think are very ambitious goals for 2030. And we have a land goal um, to maintain the 35 million acres of native grasslands in the care of beef producers. So, you know, we really recognize what a, what a treasure it is to have these lands, um, to be able to preserve and protect them. And, and not just only so that they can be part of a thriving food system, you know, with cattle turning grass into delicious beef but also so that they can be enjoyed for all Canadians. And, and when you're driving across the prairies or um, you know, if you get to go to Grasslands National Park that you get to have that sense of peace and calm that comes with you know, sitting in a grassland and, and listening to um, the birds and the wildlife that are there. It's really, it's, it's quite a treasure. Um, so just want to touch on, you know, I call this uh, birds, bees, and beef, you know, so um, we hear sometimes uh, that people think that the wildlife and cattle, you know, that they're competing for resources, and, and that's really not the case. Um, you know, as Ben says in Guardians of the Grasslands, cattle are really good at sharing um, the environments which they live in. And so actually, you know, rather than wildlife existing on these farms and ranches, you know, in spite of, of beef, it's actually really because of beef that they're there. So, you know, there's over a thousand plant and animal species that live on our native grasslands. And, you know, 60 of those species are, are currently at risk. And so, you know, if it wasn't uh, beef producers keeping these lands intact, we would have a really even more dire situation for that wildlife. Um, so really what I'd love for you to take from this is that um, cattle occupy about a third of the land in Canada that produces food, but they provide two thirds of the wildlife habitat. And um, it's actually considered the most valuable wildlife habitat. So it just shows you how they're able to, you know, coexist quite easily. Um, for the film itself, uh, you know, talking about next steps and where are we going to go with it, um, you will be one of the last groups to watch the film before it becomes publicly available. So that was part of our distribution strategy is that um, when we created this film, we were really uh, trying to get into uh, audiences that don't have a background in agriculture. And so we thought, you know, what better way to try and do that than to submit it for film festivals. So it's been in its uh, film festival season and um, we've been selected for 17 film festivals all across Canada, um, just about every single province. Uh, it's won awards at several of them. And what's really exciting for us is that a lot of the um, film festival events were, you know, uh, climate change or environment themed. And so one of the biggest ones that we were selected for, it's called Elements Environmental Film Festival, and it's based out of Vancouver. And they've had, uh, you know, guests like David Suzuki and Greta Thunberg that come and speak at this event. So for them to see the value in this short documentary and to really get behind the message of, you know, cattle being part of the solution is just so exciting for us. So um, just want to let you know that the film is going to be publicly available uh, in a couple of weeks on May 4th. And we're having a launch event with our partners, Ducks Unlimited Canada and the Nature Conservancy of Canada. So um, if you're interested in attending or sharing that with friends and family, <clears throat> excuse me, please let me know. And we would love to share the link with you. Um, the more, the merrier. And, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, then it will be available on YouTube so you can freely share there as well. And that's it really for me. I wanted to keep it uh, short and sweet. So I know you've seen the URL in a couple places, but it's there as well. Just guardiansofthegrasslands.com or .ca, either one works. Um, I've got my email there. So please feel free to contact me directly, shoot me an email as well, my uh, Twitter handle. Um, you can feel free to add me on social media. So if I could 
leave you with anything, I would just say that you can feel good about, you know, eating Canadian beef and that uh, the farmers and ranchers that are raising beef cattle, you know, that we really feel that we are part of the solution and, and we're all working towards the same thing together. So thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. That was fantastic. I, I have to admit, I did have to put myself off video because my glasses were fogging up. <laughs> from tears I uh, I've seen that one so many I've seen it a few times as well and it still gets me um I, I think one of the things that I think is important for all of us to take away too is we we think so globally now um with social media how it is um we hear all all about global and I think sometimes we have to remember to come in national and then we have to come in locally and with each one of those comes different needs and different issues. And I think that's a, a nice way to segue into our next speaker. Um, we have Sandra Voss and I saw Diana Shea bring up a question about grasslands are at West, what about Ontario or in the East? And we know that the lands are so different. And when we all, you know, majority of us are from Ontario, when we're driving, you do see that's one thing that you do see on the land is cattle and the importance that they're there. And um, during this pandemic, I've had the opportunity to come back home to the farm and I've never walked the farm so much as you're trying to get out. And I, we've noticed how our bush has changed and how some of these uh, species, uh, prickly ash is coming into our bush and really taking over. And we're realizing it's because we don't have the cattle anymore. So I'm like, we need to bring cattle back. And my dad's like, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a whole other question, whole other debate. But, you know, the next speaker I would like to introduce is Sandra Voss. And Sandra is one of our 19,000 farmers across Ontario. And she raises uh, cattle in uh, on 80 acres. It's a cow-calf farm. So that means she raises cows to have calves um, and uh, it, it, she, Sandra has a really interesting background because she started in her nursing and she's going to talk a little bit about how she moved in but when Amy in the in the video were talking about how urban centers are encroaching on Sandra can comment on to that because her farm is very close and it's interesting how Sandra does work with towns to be able to understand what it means. Because actually you are now within city limits. Are you not deemed that? Yeah, so that's hard thinking about having a farm and then you're deemed within city limits. That provides, it's a whole other can of worms to have yeah. to deal with. So I wanted to introduce Sandra and I've gotten to know Sandra over the last few years. She's been an amazing speaker for us. She has participated in many of these various events and she has some wonderful uh, information to share with everyone today. But we're gonna start, Eileen, with Sandra's question because uh, it, it's, a, it's an important question too to ask as we tend to think of, you know, one of the things that I hear a lot of is on our social post is factory farming. Beef farming is so big, but our first question, can you bring that up? Uh, Eileen, do you think? Um, I'm going to ask Joy to do that. Can you bring that okay. up, Joy? There it is. Okay. What is the average cow, beef cow herd size in Canada? So thinking about Canada. Kind of here, there we go. Thanks, Carol. <laughs> How are we doing? Oh, neck and neck, 169. Oh, it's a tie there, okay. Sandra, do you wanna give the answer? I sure can. Across <laughs> Canada, the average herd size is 69, is the correct mm -hmm. answer. And if we think about Ontario, uh, for a while there, we were running somewhere around 30 cows per farm. Um, it's a little bit more if you include um, the feedlots and, you know, where the calves go after they're done on our farms. But um, well done. Good guesses. And, and probably 
30, 40 years ago, it wouldn't have been uncommon to have 100 cattle on a lot more farms. Um, just as an interesting statistic, the cattle numbers in Ontario, when I started farming in 2001, they were up over 400,000 beef cows. And I think what now we're down to about 267,000. And I always tell people there's more white-tailed deer in Ontario. So get off my back about cattle are killing the world because I just know there's hardly any of us left. I also tell people some days I'm going to be in a zoo as the last remaining beef farmer. So, you know, <laughs> anyways. Um, okay, so thank you very much for the invitation to be here um, tonight. And um, it, I, I'm always in awe when um, we can cross into other professional fields and tell our stories. And I work in an industry where there's a tad more males than females. And um, they, you know, hearing what Canada Beef does, they think nobody listens to them, nobody's out promoting their product. And I wish I could just convey back to my guys that, you know, we are out there slogging it out with consumers and it's a, it's a good thing. So my story quickly, and then I, I might show you a few slides of how I interpret trying to replicate that idea of grasslands here in Southern Ontario. Um, my farm is was in Brant County and I was shoved into the city. So I'm now in Brantford and I'm designated my land eventually will be employment land. So they're gonna wait for me to die and then somebody will buy my farm and probably turn it into warehouses. Um, so I came from a public health background and I got a call one day from a cousin who said, do you wanna buy a farm? I gotta sell a farm, I need some money. So I said, sure, what the heck? And I bought this farm. I didn't know anything about farming. I was afraid of cows. I was, didn't know how to drive a tractor or, or no, really anything. And, uh, but I figure if you go and buy a farm, you gotta go learn and be a, a farmer. So I've been on an adventure for 20 years now, learning to be a farmer. And as I say to people, the public health nurse in me says, you've got to focus on health promotion. You've got to do stuff that's safe uh, that I can do by myself as a female because I don't have brute strength. I didn't have a dad who was a farmer and I had a whole bunch of neighbors that were waiting for me to fail so they could rent my land. So I went off on a trip to New Zealand one year and was fascinated with the concept of rotational grazing, which means you move your animals to fresh grass every day. And I've always believed the nurse in me says that if you want good health, you have to start with good food. And good food in my eyes means good soil because that's where the microbial activity goes that makes all those wonderful energetic symbiotic relationships work for the plant that then goes into the cows, that then goes into the meat, that then goes into people who want to eat the meat. So I'm just going to, um, so my philosophy also is this land is only on loan to me. Um, I will be gone and it will still be there for time on end. And my responsibility is to act like a good steward and take care of that land. And some days I scratch my head and think, oh, what I'm doing is all wrong and it you know, give it up. And then other days when I go out and I see that relationships that's happening on the land, I am just so blessed to be able to do this. So I'm going to share my screen, ladies. You don't have to keep my face on if you don't want to. And um, I put together this little, um, where did it go? Okay. Good. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll just get past this. So the idea of the health promotion, you know, so how do I do that as a farmer? Well, I, I, I pick quiet cows. I follow a vaccination protocol that is preemptive pr to protect against different diseases. I have a working area and a chute so that I, the, the cattle are comfortable and I'm comfortable. I look at the weather, when's the best time to have calves so I don't run into trouble with that. I look at other ways of um, controlling flies, for example, like concentrated garlic powder. And I use a two-stage weaning um, program so that the calves aren't traumatized when they're weaning, um, so that they're used to being with their mothers, but they can't nurse. So these were just some of the things that I did as a farmer. And then this is an example of the fall grazing. So here in Ontario- so I don't think you're, sorry, Sandra, your screen's not moving ahead there. It didn't? 
No. Let's see. Is there a trick for Sandra? Because uh, I can change it on my end. Nope. Did it move for everyone else or was it just my computer? Peggy, oh, can you? It didn't move. I'm wondering, Joy, if you could um, move the slides for Sandra, please. Move the slides for Sandra? Yeah, move them yeah, forward. Is that possible? Um, I, it's not possible because she's sharing her own screen. Right, oh, but if we okay. load her presentation, if, oh. she, if Sandra stops sharing and Joy, you load it and then we can move ahead and support. Oh, oh there no, there it came now. Screen. There it came now. It came now. Sorry. I, I see your handling facility. So maybe okay. it just takes a bit of time to load. Yeah. Um, should I go back to the slideshow? Or just do this? Can I you think just that's actually? fine. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Mm -hmm. So things like you want to keep your cattle quiet. And if you have happy, quiet cattle through their whole life process, that certainly makes a difference in, in the type of meat that you eventually get to eat. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. We thought we had this. Um... Technology, that's okay. Hmm. Can't do it. Hmm. Sandra, if you like, we have your presentation. Joy can load it and we could move it ahead under your instruction if you like. Sure. Yeah, if that works for you. Yeah, we'll okay. just pick the key ones. I can okay. just download it. So if you could please um, stop screen sharing then Sandra, then Joy will load, load it on our end. We'll just take a moment. Um, Joy, while you do that, um, okay. I, go ahead, Sandra. I was just going to say, and I just wanted to show you um, the whole idea of building grass and building carbon sequestration allows the variety of critters and insects and bees that come and live safely on the farm. And it amazes me every year that if you watch the growth of your grass, you allow flowering of certain plants, the bees all come at certain times. Other times the monarch butterflies will come and they will fill up before they start their journey um, south. And now I'm finding I have more interesting mammals. Uh, a red fox moved in this spring and I have this deal with the coyotes. They leave me alone and I don't let people hunt them on my land. Uh, the variety of birds were starting to categorize uh, how many different ones and the butterflies we've started taking pictures and keeping a, a, a list and I'd, I'd like to work on the insects as well. Everything, I have a creek, we keep the cattle out of the creek, we give them fresh water, we give them grass every day um, and we move them. And the biggest thing people say to me is, oh, you know, manure is really bad for the land. And I say, Manure is the best black gold that you'll ever have to get that soil microbes kicking into action. And when they talked about the cattle off the land, it's very evident what happens on one side of my fence where the cattle are not allowed to the side that they come and they graze. On the one side of the fence, I get wild garlic, I get all kinds of invasive species. And it's like, if the cattle were on that side, I bet you I could get, clean that out and the grasses would come back again. So people think cattle are bad for the forest, but actually in BC now and uh, other places, they're using cattle to try to keep the fires, the fires down in the forest. Cattle go in, knock out all the dead wood, let the sun in, let the grasses come back. So um, a little bit about why I do this. Um, people uh, read all kinds of different things about cattle and grass and it's funny, I did an interview for CHCH recently and the first question out of her mouth was, you know, do you have a factory farm? And uh, it just makes me heartbroken that people don't realize that there's a whole different way of local farming. People who wanna protect the world and buy um, protein that's not meat, they don't understand the huge um, greenhouse gases that go into the flying these things all over the world and putting them together into a product that is not meat. And I think, you know, cattle are raised, they get on a truck 20 minutes, they're at the abattoir, their life is over very quickly, the food gets sold, the whole carcass gets sold. And my footprint is very minimal compared to 
bringing something in from offshore and mixing it with something else and then moving it thousands of miles down to a warehouse. So I think I'm, I'm a great believer in local. I'm a great believer in the beef farmer and the ranchers because you have to be able to figure things out. You don't have a lot of money to do things like in some other industries. And I think you, in your soul, in your heart, you watch that symbiosis and that connectivity that is very rare in life today. And I just feel blessed that I can be part of that. Sandra, uh, she's very, mm -hmm. interested. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what I find is I like the word stewardship. You use that um, mm -hmm. sustainability has become this sort of buzzword that everyone wants yeah. to use, but I really appreciate the word stewardship. Can you talk a little bit about that and actually the award that you won through Ontario Beef Farmers? Okay. Um, the Beef Farmers of Ontario, as long as, as well as every other cattle association across Canada does something called the Environmental Stewardship Award and it's sponsored by our RBC and CCA and different um, organizations. And it's an attempt to recognize farmers who look at their land perhaps a little differently than a cash cropper would and try to keep the natural features, try to enhance those features and try to keep that wonderful cycle of life going without overriding one to create problems in another. So the Stewardship Awards looks at farmers who look at the holistic, I, I call it like a holistic view of life and a stewardship is different than sustainability. In my mind, the land is a gift. And how I do that is I'm gonna ruin that gift or I'm going to enhance that gift so that it can sustain for the next generation if that's the plan. And so you look at everything and I look at things like if I change this part of the land, what's gonna to happen to the cows? What's gonna to happen to the insects? What's gonna to happen to the water? So they look at things like, what are you doing on your farm that protects the grasses, what protects the waterways. And water is a big thing here in Canada and we want mm -hmm. to keep it as clean. We want fish, we want all kinds of healthy um, organisms to live in that. So you fence the cattle out from standing in the creeks. You, with the rotational grazing, you move them every single day to fresh grass. That way the manure is spread evenly. They're not just staying under a tree all summer long. It gives the chance for the grasses to come back. And the cattle act like stimulus to the world. So every time they graze, you leave some, but birds bring different plants. The sun brings different plants and the seed bank in the soil is unbelievable. And it's the cows that trigger it and allow those seeds that maybe have laid dormant for years and years and years to come forth again. It always amazes me the species that show up um, that I had no idea I had on the farm of the last few years. Um, so that's stewardship awards. Once you get that in your heart, you, you want to continue to do things to keep that land as um, special and not put our impact as the farmer to say, this is the way it's gonna be done and I don't care in the sense that this is how I can manage it. You're constantly balancing, I call them sins of omission and sins of commission. What do I do today that makes a difference? Or if I didn't do something yesterday, what grief am I going to cause myself down the world? So uh, we always encourage beef farmers to um, be nominated for that and to rethink maybe how they have done things. And again, recognizing the cow and the farmer are just one minuscule part of this whole natural cycle and that everyone that's on your land has a right to be there and how you work those, um, everyone together. Well, that's what keeps me going, I guess. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's wonderful that you can share these types of stories. When you work within an industry or you work within a profession, you get wrapped up and you think everyone always understands what's happening and having you share these stories this evening or sharing your learnings, it, it then I think allows others to have a greater appreciation. When you go into that grocery store and you see the foods that are available that we can purchase, you know, think a bit more about where it comes from, how it's raised, how it is grown. And it's so important. And I think it's wonderful with the Tessa Award to, to it's a recognition by another farmer. So it, it shows um, 
people appreciating and seeing what happens. And when each province has it, you can see all the unique things that happen. And Sandra, as I was saying before, has been gen very generous with her time talking to different groups. And she participated in a Taste Canada event. And um, the other winner was from BC. And it was interesting listening to uh, Sandra's story and, um, oh, her name just slipped my mind from BC. Ricky, and listening the some of the child differences, you know, Ricky's in uh, the heart of BC, Sandra's in, uh, you know, <laughs> close Southern to an Ontario. urban area in Ontario, <laughs> and, and what are some of those challenges? Maybe just before, uh, to end on that one note, Sandra, um, you know, that it came through in, in the video as well, the urban encroachment, what do you see, um, you did say, um, who knows what's gonna to happen to your farmland someday, but do you see, have you put together some future plans? Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm like all farmers, I'm not gonna die because who's gonna look after the cows, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just keep on going forever. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's really, um, and if you don't have kids, and because I came into this first generation, this was my passion. I don't expect anyone in my family to come home from across Canada um, to farm this little farm, but there are options. You know, I suppose I could leave something to the Nature Conservancy, um, but maybe I can find a young farmer that I can rent to so that they can carry on. So there's those options to certainly consider, but. Um, the sad part is, is even if I rented it to another farmer, it would probably get um, worked up and corn and beans would go in, which, you know, everyone's got costs to, to worry about. But I, it makes me sad that there's not going to be my little green farm in a sea of brown Google, as I call it. Because if you Google my farm area, it's usually permanent green and surrounded by eventually the city's going to be creeping up my concession. And that makes me sad. But that's the reality of living in Southern Ontario. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sandra. That's fantastic. Thanks I for really putting up with the uh, pictures that didn't work. <laughs> oh, that's okay. And actually what we'll do too is share, um, the uh, Beef Farmers of Ontario did a wonderful video of Sandra and uh, we can share that after. Um, I'll give it to Brooklyn and Joy and we can share it on our social media, but it has a, a nice overview of Sandra's story, so. And uh, so our next speaker, I'm uh, uh, excited to introduce Carly Reimer. So as you know, I've mentioned before, I'm here at the farm with my parents and my, um, they have been huge supporters of Ducks Unlimited. And I went around the house today, <laughs> and I counted. And I think uh, my parents from doing all the different Ducks Unlimited dinners over the years, I think I counted 20 paintings and at least uh, 20 different duck and grouse uh, de um, decoys and statues around the house. <laughs> Carly, you guys have been well represented. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to have that conservation side here this evening too. You know, we have um, from Cattlemen's and, and that side, then we had the actual beef producer, but we work together with conservation. And I think a lot of people may not always understand that or realize. So. Um, I'd like to introduce Carly Reimer tonight. She uh, also grew up on a beef farm uh, in Manitoba and she grew up on a farm next to a Ducks Unlimited Canada wetland project. And I learned that because Carly is also part of our, she's one of our um, advocates on our My Canadian Beef campaign. And she shares her stories on our website along with her family's pictures. And she's an international and national award-winning agricultural journalist and communicator. And Carly's path led her straight to Ducks Unlimited Canada, where she currently leads the marketing communications for the conservation group. And she's actively engaged on communication committees for the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. We've mentioned that. You might have seen that particular group's name mentioned with McDonald's ads and so forth. And the Soil Conservation Council of Canada and chairs committees for the National Environmental Farm Plan and the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Crops as well. So we're really thrilled to have you here this evening, Carly. And I think we'll start with your poll question then. Yes. 
And here it is. And thank you so much, Michelle. I am thrilled to be here. Um, this is a topic I am extremely passionate about, and that is cattle and conservation. So my poll for tonight, and I think Carol kind of hinted to this in the comments, so thanks for that, Carol, to get a jump start on this, is what industry takes up 33% of agricultural land, so only 33%, but accounts for almost 70% of wildlife habitat? That's a lot of habitat on a small land base. So is it vegetable farming, beef farming, the wine industry, which you guys have in Ontario and it's fantastic, I've been there, grain farming, or is it another one? There's, we have so many wonderful agricultural industries in this country. Um, so I think we're, we're leaning more towards beef farming. Um, that <laughs> hint may, may have helped, but there's a few more people that might want to chime in because maybe we'll throw <laughs> throw a wrench into this and 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 spin it in a different direction but <laughs> perfect no I think we're almost there and it looks like beef farming for the win <laughs> uh, there we go and so the poll is closed and that is correct so beef farming and ranching it is only about a third of the agricultural land in Canada but it does account for almost 70% of wildlife habitat. And that reason alone, the wildlife habitat is, is very much why Ducks Unlimited Canada and myself um, is so involved within the beef industry. So like I said, I'm thrilled to be here and to kind of give you a little bit of insight uh, into my world and you know why I care about the beef industry so much and, and a little bit about conservation and, and, and science and why it's important that we have that. So. Before I get into it, I just wanted to give a quick nod to Sandra. Mm -hmm. uh, for those that don't know, and I was actually gonna bring up the TESA, so the Environmental mm -hmm. Stewardship Award. It's, it's an award I have been a part of for a number of years. I am very proud of that. Ducks Unlimited Canada is now a foundational partner of that award. And beef farmers like Sandra are the best of the best in the country. They are implementing practices and taking care of their animals better, you know, as, as good as you can, you know, right now in this country. And to be able to recognize them is crucially important to tell that good story, you know, of bee farm in the country. So I just wanted to give a nod, you know, to Sandra because it was wonderful to hear her story tonight. And just so everyone knows that, you know, she is a leader in this industry um, here in Canada. And we definitely, as a foundational partner of that award, hope to tell that story more and, and highlight those farmers and ranchers across the country that are doing such amazing work on their farms. So what Sandra does is she farms with nature, not against it. it, it she coexists with nature. And, and that's basically my topic for today. So I work for Ducks Unlimited Canada, but Michelle actually alluded to, I did grow up on a beef farm here in Manitoba. So here on the prairies next to a Ducks Unlimited Canada project. So yes, the same company I work for now um, is the one that I grew up alongside. So I saw that connectivity between wildlife and conservation and agriculture my whole life. It is something I lived and breathed and, and truly believe in. And so the land I grew up on is, is in an area called the Interlake, which is in Manitoba. It's in between our two major lakes, Lake Winnipeg and Lake Manitoba. And it is not the best land for growing crops. It is rocky. It is full of marshland. It is, you know, it is harsh land. And really the only good thing that you can use that land for is for grazing livestock, grazing cattle, or for wildlife. We have a tremendous amount of wildlife where I grew up and currently where I live. I can look outside my window right now. There's a herd of cattle. They are all calving. The calves are on the ground. They're happy and playing in the sunshine here in Manitoba today, not the snow you got in Ontario. But those, those cattle are in the same pasture with ducks and geese and cranes and, and all sorts of wildlife, the deer that run through. I mean, they, they coexist together. And that is something that was alluded to in Guardians of the Grasslands is cattle share the ecosystem and they can live together and they coexist swimmingly, I guess I could say. So I think it's important to realize that. Um, I am a conservationist. You know, I grew up in agriculture. My background is agriculture and beef, but I am a true conservationist. And I think I want you to take note of that. Oftentimes, 
people may think that conservation and agriculture are at odds, you know, that, you know, we're all about the environment and we don't care about the profitability of, you know, the farm sector or, you know, the livelihoods of rural, you know, communities. Uh, but that is not the case. We are partners on the landscape and we are working toward win-win solutions when it comes to conservation and the environment and you know growing sustainable healthy you know safe food so i am a huge supporter of sustainable agriculture and the canadian beef industry even though i am a conservationist we do work together that way uh, you know we're always trying to find ways of making ourselves relatable you know into your audience and really I'm also a mother. I have two young daughters. Both of them love steak. <laughs> they love, you know, meat sauce with spaghetti. And so we are no strangers to serving beef quite regularly in our home. I'm an athlete. I have played baseball my entire life. I play hockey as well. I'm actively engaged in my community. And there are all these conversations I have, you know, in these various groups when it comes to conservation in the beef industry. And there's so many misconceptions out there. But being a conservationist and being a part of Ducks Unlimited Canada, like I am proud to feed my family beef. I know that that beef in Canada is raised in a sustainable, responsible way. And it is a safe and healthy, nutritious food option. And I will continue to tell that story. And as Michelle you know, had mentioned too, uh, you know, I am an advocate for the beef industry and will continue to do that because I know where, where my food is coming from and I trust the people that are raising that food and doing it in such a great way that it works with nature and the environment. Um, healthy food comes from healthy, sustainable landscapes. You know, there's nothing better than that. And we've learned a lot about grasslands today. And really, there's nothing more sustainable than the Canadian grasslands. I do want to say we are really focused on the prairies and guardians of the grasslands, but lands that are grazed by cattle farmers across the country. So I have, you know, I have traveled all across the country from Atlantic Canada to Quebec and Ontario, all through Eastern Canada. Those lands used by farmers are important. It's not just the prairie grasslands, it's just we are losing them at an alarming rate, but all the forage lands, the pollinator habitat, the wetlands, the treed areas, and, and you know, those are all crucially important to what we do. So for those that don't know, um, Ducks Unlimited Canada, that is who I work with. Um, they are one of the most trusted conservation organizations in the country. We've been around for over 80 years. And as a national charity, our mission is to protect and restore habitats. So that's homes for wildlife and animals and other critters. So that's wetlands and grasslands. And we do that across Canada. And those are areas that we work with are mainly located on private land. So in the you know, hands of farmers and ranchers. And so that's why working with the agricultural groups um, with farmers and ranchers is, is crucial to what we do to preserve our habitat and to, to conserve as much of it as possible. So these areas are not just for waterfowl like our beloved mallard ducks that you see in our logo, uh, but they're crucial for all kinds of birds, wildlife, species at risk and pollinators. And the key thing about this is that we actually rely on science when we deliver our programs, when we form partnerships. We have actually an institute for wetlands and waterfowl research. So a whole bunch of scientists that they have dedicated their life's work to studying these ecosystems and their importance. And, you know, finding those, those good partnerships with groups we work with, like the beef industry, all of that is based on the science that we have done or that we've worked with others. And that is kind of our guiding light, our North Star, I guess you can say, and how we form these partnerships. So science and understanding grasslands and wetlands and that those lands are held, you know, um, and protected and saved by the beef farmers and ranchers across the country is the very reason why we are such great partners um, with this group. And we're not the only, um, you know, environmental group or conservation group that does this. You saw in the Guardians of the Grasslands, the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Um, we talked earlier about Birds Canada. There are many, you know, provincial and national conservation groups that are all on the same page when it comes to supporting our Canadian farmers and ranchers, you know, across the board from coast to coast. And so I think that's important. It's, it's, it is a team effort and we all believe that we need to have cattle on the landscape. So many people don't realize that ducks actually nest in the grasslands surrounding the wetlands. So 
it's not just water. They need that mix of grass and water to thrive. And what I always tell, you know, people always ask me, why would you be working with the beef industry? You know, you're a conservation group. Well, cows need grass and water to live and so do ducks. And because of that coexistence, they using the same resources, living together, uh, it's important for us to work together because we have the same goals for a sustainable landscape. And when we talk about grasslands, you know, we were talking about the bison and guardians of the grasslands. And for thousands of years, those bisons, you know, their role was to keep our grasslands healthy and cattle are doing that exact same thing today. So going into cattle and conservation a little bit more, there is an untold story when it comes to beef farming and ranching. The misconception I hear and Sandra had spoke to it a little bit earlier is that cattle are bad for the environment. But that is simply not the case. Raising beef in Canada is actually good for our planet. It's good for our environment. It's good for our wildlife and our ecosystems. Land used to graze cattle stores a colossal amount of carbon. And that storage of carbon is our solution to climate change. It's, it's our way of fighting climate change. Agriculture and sustainability and, and keeping these lands, these you know, intact, so grasslands and wetlands that store this carbon is the key to helping us fight climate change. These lands also conserve our soil. And I do sit with, uh, on the Soil Conservation Council of Canada, and I, I would have to shout out, it is National Soil Conservation Week. And so if anyone has heard of the Soil Your Undies, <laughs> a campaign that we've ran the last few years, um, I can tell you more about that. But, you know, mm -hmm. Soil is becoming more and more important to people. They're realizing that you need good soil to have good food and, and, and healthy food. And if without soil, we cannot have a healthy food system. 95% of our food comes from the soil. And so it's crucially important you know, that we have that. And grasslands and having a grazer like cattle on the landscape really helps protect and keep our soil healthy. These areas provide clean water. They filter our water. I mean, and we were talking about how, you know, important water is to our country. They protect us from flooding and drought. That is a, an environmental service that grasslands and wetlands provide. And we are no strangers to flooding and drought across the country, but these help mitigate the effects of climate change, flooding and drought, and help provide resiliency against those major swings in, you know, in our weather and our climate. And again, these areas are full of life. They're full of biodiversity, including species at risk, you know, and pollinators, which we care so much about. So cattle share that ecosystem. And Sandra was talking about, you know, what could happen to her farm. And just recently, there's a, a pasture that's right across from, from my house here, where I live in the country. And it has always been full of wildlife, full of deer and fox and coyotes. Um, and it, it was a, a hayland that they would take the hay bales off that to feed cattle over the winter. It is the first time that it has been cultivated since I've lived here. That hayland, that forage area, that wildlife habitat is now black earth cultivated. It'll be turned into, you know, soybeans or canola or corn. Um, and all the benefits that that land previously had will be gone. And, you know, it, it is a real threat to the to the systems is that cultivation, development, communities, urban sprawl, these things are real threats to our wildlife habitat and these areas that provide so many benefits to us. And so I often say, you know, when I'm standing in a in a in a forage field you hear the life just teeming around you. You hear the, the bees, you see the butterflies, you hear the birds, you know, you have a duck pair or a goose pair nesting, you know, nearby. The deer, the coyotes, the fox, the badgers, the raccoons, everything is, is teeming in those areas. But if you're in a soybean field that is a monoculture um, that is just growing that one crop, all that life isn't there anymore. And a lot of the life that was there before it was cultivated will probably be displaced somewhere else. Um, so having cattle on the landscape is crucial um, when it comes to our environment and keeping that mosaic and happy ecosystem alive and well. Uh, so I won't go much more into that, you know, we'll, we'll have a chance to go into discussions, but I just wanted to say that it is important outside the prairies, all the land that cattle ranchers and farmers have outside the prairies is also important. Uh, and, you know, what your farmers in Ontario are doing, you know, like Sandra, you know, is, is excellent. And I think this group, you know, just having this discussion and learning more about this topic is really important. The last thing I will leave, because I think I am out of time now, uh, is that there is power in partnerships. 
And mm -hmm. I say that all the time. And we have a fantastic partnership with Canada Beef, with uh, the Canadian Cattlemen's Association through Amy and her group, with the, all the farmers and ranchers like Sandra across the country that we work with. And grasslands as that threatened ecosystem are starting to be realized how important they are to the health of our country. And so we've actually had some major funders come on board recently to help save the last remaining grasslands we have. The Weston Family Community Foundation has actually, um, they're giving $25 million to help preserve grasslands forever. So uh, conservation easement is what they are funding and we, they're working with conservation groups like Ducks Unlimited Canada to save those lands in perpetuity. So where we would pay the landowner who owns those lands to never break or drain those lands ever. And, and it goes along with the land title. So those lands will be protected and be able to, for future generations to be in that same state and providing all those benefits you know, forever. And McDonald's and Cargill. So McDonald's Canada and Cargill just recently gave us $1.25 million as well. Um, and they're actually hoping that we will take previously cultivated areas, so land that used to grow crops, and turn that into forage land. Uh, you know, it, it's just to help store carbon, to help filter our water and all those other benefits where we're actually going to convert 125,000 acres in the next few years, which is the same as removing um, 75,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So these are not small numbers. And that is a lot of, you know, those are true conservation solutions that we can use to help with climate change, to help store carbon and to keep our environment healthy. So with that, I will end. I'm sorry I went a couple minutes over time, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. No, I love your enthusiasm and passion, Carly. It's uh comes through loud and clear on a Zoom call. Um, we do have uh, teachers who are on, on the Zoom too. And I think you should talk about, um, I know Joyce Parslow loves this idea, your uh, soil, your panties. <laughs> Maybe just uh, give a little brief overview of what that project is, because it is for students and, and kids to learn. It's fantastic for educators. Absolutely. It is just to show how much life we have in the soil. So under your feet, it's not just dead stuff. That mm -hmm. It is teeming with life. There's all sorts of things going on under our feet. And to show that in a hands-on, you know, do-it-yourself soil science experiment, what you can do is get yourself a pair of white cotton underwear, so whatever that, you know, brand may be. You would, anywhere there's soil, it could be a garden, a flower bed, your lawn, um, a field. You would dig a shallow trench you would place the underwear in that little, you know, little shallow hole. You cover it up with the soil, put a marker in there so you can come back and find it again. And about three to, you know, four months later, you dig it up and see what all that, you know, the world under our feet did to that cotton. So that cotton is carbon. Everything is made of carbon. And so the life in the soil will eat away and use that carbon for their life cycle. And, and it just is a really interesting way of showing that there's a lot going on that we don't know about um, that only soil scientists seem to <laughs> have figured out and it, it's a fun experiment on and on how our ecosystems work so no, soil your know. undies <laughs> so your undies I mean it's got a great name right there but I know um, some uh, participants here who have uh, grandchildren I think Mary Carver I can see her doing that with her grandchildren it's a great activity <laughs> <laughs> not to put you on the spot Mary but uh, thank you so much to all three speakers tonight I think um uh, you know, I live this every day. I find it so interesting and it's so wonderful to be able to share this conversation with this audience today. And I think in keeping with tomorrow being Earth Day, that um, to know that the farmers and ranchers across Canada are working really hard to raise cattle with world-class standards and in innovative practices, and that uh, we're working to together to ensure that the generation and the next generations have great land to work from and to carry on those traditions because it's pretty important this land to have. So maybe I'll turn it back over to you, Peggy, and if you wanna lead any questions, but again, thank you to Carly, to Sandra and to Amy for this evening. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Michelle and Amy and Sandra and Carly. I just, um, uh, I guess we need to take inspiration from, I believe Amy, you said the cows were the unsung heroes and their ability to share 
And so I think if there's a message out of tonight, it's, it's sharing. So uh, Michelle, first of all, sharing not only the dollars that put on the event from Canada Beef, but also sharing your incredible contacts and bringing all of this knowledge and heart and inspiration to our speaker series tonight. And thank you very, very much for sharing that. And Amy, uh, you had mentioned that uh, March 4th, the Guardians of the Grasslands will be available publicly. And I think that's something that we can share. I know that the OHEA definitely likes to get out uh, quality, important, uh, helpful information to families. And I think that, uh, you know, calm in the chaos, uh, comfort food in many ways is what we heard about tonight. So we definitely want to share that, Amy, and congratulations on such a successful documentary. And, and Sanda, thank you very much for sharing uh, your award. I know uh, you seem like a humble person, but it was really uh, very nice that you shared that tonight because then we got to understand uh, a bit of a uh, part of the world and part of Canadian um, society and a demographic that we don't know much about, but is so encouraging and comforting once you do hear that. So thank you for sharing that. And uh, Carly, thank you so much for your wealth of information. And I think it's so critical, as you said, power and partnerships, and that um, the farmers are just so busy getting the job done that we need those partnerships and we need those champions and those cheerleaders and those people that are really interested in myth busting. Because when you hear sustainability, you don't often think of the Canadian grasslands and you don't often think of beef. And it's interesting, I was talking to a philosopher very recently um, and he's interested in food. And I said, well, what can philosophers offer us that will help us dig our way out of all of this you know, chaos of information? And he goes, always watch for where the logic breaks. And I think out of the broad continuum of everything we've heard tonight, the logic doesn't break. You know, it's, it's there. And I think there's a very few arguments in sustainability where the logic doesn't break. And I think that that's an very, uh, something I wanted to share with everyone tonight, because I, when I heard that, I thought, yes, that's the way out. If I could use my own judgment and realize the logic breaks so many times, all you have to do is go to Toronto or LA or New York and you know, nah, it's not the cows. <laughs> it's not the cows. That one doesn't pass the sniff test, so to speak. <laughs> So I think that um, in keeping with the sharing that it, if we can tell our friends what we heard and if we, uh, when we do share through the OHEA channels, get that information that we just share and share and share and get those messages out there, uh, because I think that's so incredibly important. And I, we've had such another amazing night that we don't have time for any more questions that if you did have any um, that you really had to ask if you could send them into the chat while we go to the um, hand it over to Brooke, uh, not Brooklyn, to uh, Rebecca, who is going to work us through the draw prizes again. And I wanted to thank very much. Oh, no, you know what? It jumped forward on me. We're having trouble with my technology. There's something going on tonight, huh? Sandra was having some challenges and I did since the beginning. Okay, so drawn prizes. We want to thank Mary Carver for her absolutely generous donations and uh, the cookbooks particularly. And thank you, Mary. And I'm going to hand it over to you now, uh, Rebecca, for our prize winners. Thank you. Um, I had a blast tonight and I definitely know I'm going to be passing along the Soil Your Undies movement. Thank you for posting that link. I saw it was in the chat. Um, so I've drawn two winners for our prizes tonight. The first one is for Mary Carver and it's um, more heart smart cooking. If any of you are looking for some great sides um, to go with any beef. So the winner of that was Irene Gibbons, who I see is still here. Um, Irene, I'll be reaching out to you by email. I have your email from our sign up list. So congratulations. Um, Thank and you. actually, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> And our second winner um, was for some Tupperware that's been kindly provided by Eileen. And we have a Tupperware winner is Jessica Lindsay. Oh, I believe is also still here with us tonight. Yeah, thanks so much. So I will also send you an email and get your address for shipping. And thank you again to all the speakers and I'll give it back to you, Peggy. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and congratulations to both our winners. Lucky ducks, no pun intended. They just keep coming tonight. I, I've been so inspired. <laughs> and thank you in the chat. <laughs> thank you again. Uh, we wanted to remind everyone that there are positions with the OHEA 
board members and we need a president elect, a chair, a VP professional development and a VP membership. And there's the email where you can get a hold of uh, the board members to express your interest. And it's a wonderful opportunity and a really great group. And it never ceases to amaze me just how far and wide the OHA, but home economists in Canada's reach is and all the interesting policy work and uh, action that they're part of. So a wonderful opportunity for anyone who's interested. I brought this up last time. I'm not necessarily promoting it. It's just FYI. I don't know if it's going to end well or not, but ABC, uh, Home Economics has gone to Hollywood and ABC has a new show called Home Economics and City TV is going to be airing it soon as well. So apparently there's three siblings, one is wealthy, uh, one is um, comfortable and the other one's struggling. So there's something happening with Home Economics and we'll see if it brings us good PR and a renewed interest as people start acting, hey, whatever happened to home economics or what is home economics? Hopefully we get some uh, fringe PR. So again, I'm not promoting it, just letting you know that it's there and we'll wait and see what unfolds and hopefully uh, it brings some interest to our field. Thank you again to our incredible sponsors, particularly Canada Beef and another just uh, world-class <coughs> presentation and so inspiring and really, uh, so there's something about the truth that makes you feel better. And I know I definitely feel better. And that's something that's really welcome and needed. So thank you very, very much to Canada Beef. And thank you very much, Michelle specifically. And thank you very much, Amy from Cattlemen's Association and Sandra, our um, farmer and crusader. Thank you. And to Carly for cheerleading and making sure that we've got the money to, to support some things that are uh, really important to Canadians in cons conservation. So thank you very much. Thank you also to uh, Canola Eat Well, our sponsors for this evening and the Egg Farmers of Ontario and the Canadian Produce Marketing Association. Thank you all very, very much. And a special thank you to the incredible planning committee for the OHEA series, Eileen, uh, Stanberry, who's somehow always there, the rock of the organization, and Leslie McGaskill, the crusading forward, making sure we do have professional development, and that it's really important in quality for our members. And as I said, Michelle, that's apple loving. Every time I see the pre-show, I'm like, I want an apple. There's apple loving Michelle, uh, who's actually what I, I sincerely mean, the secret sauce. You're, you're there making this a richer, incredible um, profession to be in. So thank you for that. And thank you to Rebecca for all your wonderful ideas and the speakers that you brought to us and for wonderfully handling the draw and uh, all that you do for us. And Brooklyn Buckley for making sure that everyone knew exactly what was happening and we're up to, up to speed and up to date with everything going on. Thank you very much, Brooklyn. And to Joy, who without whom we wouldn't have had any events because she was our technical expert behind the scenes. She worked tirelessly to make sure that our event was flawless and she achieved that every single time. So thank you, thank you very much to the planning committee. And uh, I, I couldn't have been happier to work with you again. Thank you all very, very much for coming this evening. I hope that you enjoyed it. We'll have our recordings available in about a month to you. And please follow, fill out your survey. That will be coming. It helps us make things better for you in the future. And thank you all very, very much. And we'll see you in the fall. Have a lovely evening. And thank you very much again to all our speakers. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. So well. Thank you very, very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. I think I'm going to try that underwear thing. <laughs> In the beginning, I thought, I don't know, is that going to end well? But I got yeah. <laughs> and I thought, okay. I that actually like just went on, I just went on the website and there's a poster explaining how to do it and everything and uh yeah so it's it would be kind of a neat thing to do with your grand with with my grandchildren so fantastic yeah. wonderful wonderful just out All of right. this world michelle just out of this world thank you okay. yeah. and, and i i'm gonna send you a formal invitation i'll send you the schedule but you got to be on the show and the archive oh. shows are on the world wide web like oh. the world like people need this message really okay. it's it's just Good. it's just very 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 important so thank Great. you. Oh, Did so you see glad. the chat bar? Everybody was like just yeah, no, raving. Well, they're very passionate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it comes through. Okay, yeah. well, you guys yeah. have a great rest of your night. Thank you, and I'll see great. you on Monday. I'll see you Monday okay. for our debrief. Have a okay. great day. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.